Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beer is specially paired with their work. Today's guest is poet Barry McDonald. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. Goodness. All so right. we're back for episode number five. Do episode you wanna number five, give Books and Brews Podcast. Quick recap of who we've had. Uh, so X uh, X X. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Even so, uh, episode number one was Lauren Nimi. Episode number two was Tucson Morrison. Episode number three was Bob Miller. Episode number four just went up uh, this month uh, in August. Rather, I shouldn't say this month. Yeah. Uh, was Catherine Kaiser. So we have had a storyteller, spoken word poet and musician, a magician and author, and a poet. And today, we welcome Barry McDonald, mm-hmm. who goes by the stage name. Uh, Tekken. The name, Tekken. And I, I suppose first, how was your month, Michael? Uh, still crazy busy. Still uh, still I am getting up to the... Uh, the crunch point right before tour. Right. I leave for tour in 10 days. Well, 10 days from when we record this. Yes, in, um, uh, so August 15th. Um, and these last 10 days are crazy because I have to finish all the paperwork for mm-hmm. tour. I have to finish up rehearsals. I have to make advance calls to all the schools. So it's like an insane uh, uh, bit of uh, work trying to get geared up. Yeah, how many colleges do you have lined up this year? Um, I, I think it goes up and down, doesn't it? It does go up and down. It's a it's a pretty good year this year. Mm-hmm. Um, we've so got uh, about three weeks. Three weeks ish. Okay. Two crews, three weeks ish. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. Well, I'm sort of in planning stages too, as I keep mentioning every month. You know, <laughs> I'm making this trip to Hawaii to see my son. And uh, Barry, that's the son you saw in the photograph on the wall. He's Mm -hmm. living down in uh, Oahu, Hawaii. And so I kind of had a monkey wrench thrown in the works when Hawaii went and changed the law on me. And uh, well, the law that says that apparently ninety percent of Airbnbs are illegal. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, the owners were unaware they were illegal. Oh. Um, so I'm not really clear if they were or if they suddenly became illegal. But all of a sudden, they're all afraid to rent to anyone. And so, you're so be sleeping on the boom, streets. Boom, boom, boom. I the just kept getting yeah, canceled, canceled, canceled. So. Um, I, I had a very stressful day scrambling to find accommodations three weeks before I fly out. Yeah, I bet. So <laughs> that would be rough. But um, I'm I have the accommodations done, and so I just need to rent a car and decide what I'm going to do on the days my son is at work. I mean, I don't know what this working for a living thing is. But <laughs> he's insistent on doing it. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. How about you, Barry? How's your month been? Oh, it's been busy. I have a business meeting coming up, um, and I've got a a host of articles to process and edit and publish. (laughs) The life of a writer. Right. It's a lot of juggling. And we always do our read of the month. Is it possible that, once again, you did not do your homework? No, but (laughs) I did not do my homework, but... Uh, I've been thinking a lot about a book that I read a while back, and okay. I can talk about that one. Speaking um, of which, I got The Baron in the Trees oh. that you talked about. I haven't gotten very far in it, but that's it's pulled up on my Kindle. Awesome. So anyway, what, what book did you think about? Uh, so it is a book called Death by Water by mm-hmm. a Japanese writer, Kenzaburo Oe. Um, it is an extraordinarily long and extraordinarily complex novel about uh, a writer at the end of his life, end of his career, Mm -hmm. wanting to write his final, like, mea culpa. Okay. um, Uh, About processing the the death of his father in a flood. mm -hmm. Um, And it it weaves through an experimental theater troupe, uh, an exploration of Japanese history immediately before and after the end of World War II. 
it, it it's long and meandering, mm-hmm. and the the writing style is sort of, meandering is the writing style. It's okay. like we start on this path, and then no, we're going to talk about this for a while. You tend yeah. toward books like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. this one was hard to get into. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to start. But once you kind of get into it and, and go so get read, the flow, uh, it is mesmerizing. Have you the read the stuff. whole thing? Yeah, I oh, read the okay. whole novel. Okay, yeah. so when did you read this? Not this. Oh, month. it's uh, a couple months ago, probably. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So there was a month you read more than one. Um, I have to admit, last month I, you know, I read a spare book so I could cover for you. <laughs> <laughs> This All right, month. you're on it. You have my back. <laughs> well, not this month. This month I only really got through, well, as I said, I started The Baron in the Trees, hmm. and then I think my computer did a restart, and I, you know, I closed down my Kindle and I forgot. Um, so I've been reading this book at Catherine's interview. I dropped one of my books in a little library, and I picked up this book in its place. And so this is called The Summer of Us by Holly Chamberlain. And um, I'd say I'm about yeah, half to two-thirds of the way through. And it's about three women who are completely different, and they're the last ones to try and snag a summer home on, uh, I don't know, Long Island or somewhere. Martha's Vineyard, I think it is. And so they get this terrible rundown little place, the only one left that nobody wanted, and they're stuck with each other because if they want their summer home, they're going to have to room together. And they're just as different as you can be. You know, there is the woman who refers to herself as the Jewish American princess. There is the kind of rough and tumble one who grew up in what she keeps referring to as, you know, moose poop New Hampshire or, (laughs) you know, mouse vomit New Hampshire. She has a new and clever name for it every time. And she grew up kind of poor with sort of a white trash family. And then there is the one who's all L.L. Bean. And um, so it's... Mostly I have liked it, but I've kind of stalled where the author fell into the trap of all the good people think exactly like the author. Mm. And it's just, it's painfully obvious. And it's like, eh, okay, right, y'all think exactly like the author. So I, I kind of stalled there, and I don't know if I'll get back into it after that. But up, in, up until that point, I really liked it. All right. And I like the fact that they're learning that they're not really the stereotypes that they first think each of the others is mm-hmm. so that is my book so uh here we are episode number five bear mcdonald uh goes by the tekken tekken is the dharma name for bear mcdonald he has lived in england japan and minnesota all of which have influenced him the themes of his life revolve around his buddhist practice and his recovery from addiction his books everyday mind look for the extraordinary hidden within everyday events he uses the sonnet form without the rhyme scheme, followed by Japanese tanka. His metaphors are inspired by Shakespeare, and he aims for the precision of Japanese poetry. Um, mixing the sonnet with the tanka combines the sensibility of the Occident and the Orient, as he has done by living in America, England, and Japan. Mm-hmm. I, I apologize, that was a little repetitive, because I actually took bios from two different places Mm -hmm. (laughs) so anyway we go ahead michael so we like to start uh with a reading okay Uh, so that's how we always begin this thing uh and we always start with a beer but the beer goes with the reading so right um so what do you have so the 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 concept of the thing for people who are just tuning in and for barry uh is that uh i read the works that the writer is going to read Okay. Uh, I look for some kind of connection, some kind of conceptual through line, something that I can latch on to, and I pair a beer to that just as I would pair a beer to food. Okay. Um, so what is the first poem you're going to be reading? So do you want me to read it? Yeah. Uh, oh, don't read definitely. it just yet. Just tell us what, he'll, what he'll the title is. The, beer. Um, the title is Circles of Sober Alcoholics. All right. So, in my life, my father is an alcoholic, and in my life, I've worked in places uh, with alcoholics, mm-hmm. and so I have, I've attended meetings, uh, and so I have a good idea of, of circles mm-hmm. of sober alcoholics, and one of the things that uh, stood out to me, and that people have actually talked to me about, is the importance of coffee. 
at a lot of meetings. I I drink a lot of coffee. Yeah, uh, it's the ever present coffee pot, um, and so uh, I was I was going for that coffee, that that thing that beverage that kind of in my experience or my my understanding kind of holds the the meeting together. I also happen to have just written a column for the Star Tribune, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, about non-alcoholic beers. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole new set of non-alcoholic beers out there that are actually good. Uh, whereas most of the past non-alcoholic beers have been pretty awful. Uh, but they're applying craft beer techniques and ingredients to create more flavorful non-alcoholic beers. So one of the best of those breweries is Athletic Brewing Company mm-hmm. out of California. Uh, the beer that I selected is called All Out. Uh, they call it a non-alcoholic extra dark. Um, so it's like a stout or a porter. So you're getting those roasty coffee notes. I enjoyed stout when I was in England. How do you like this one? Well, it, it tastes like that. It tastes like uh, mm-hmm. one of the English brews. It's kind of remarkable to me how good these new... Non-alcoholic beer. I have them in my fridge. I'm going to keep them in my fridge because they're they're really tasty. And some nights I want a beer, but I don't want alcohol. I don't want the buzz. So, so um, you know, obviously I have no real history with non-alcoholic beer. Is did it used to be that it wouldn't taste like a beer at all? Well, they were all uh, golden lagers for one thing. Okay. And Lager. the technique of de-alcoholizing beer Mm -hmm. uh, has been really harmful. So you bring Mm -hmm. it up, you raise the temperature up, and alcohol uh, evaporates at a lower temperature than than, uh, water. So the alcohol would evaporate out. But heat is really bad for beer. It just damages it beyond repair. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you had the effects of that damage. So they just really weren't good. Okay. <laughs> but now so there are new techniques, new techniques for, for de alcoholizing okay. and, and they can make beers that Because taste I don't good. think mm. I would know the difference if you yeah. hadn't told me. Hmm. So cheers. Uh, go cheers. ahead and read the poem. Okay. Circles of sober alcoholics. Come with a story and take your turn as one of us welcome within the circle, meeting every morning for an hour, and when we're done we'll dispense to our lives with a renewed sense of purpose because it's not about beating the obsession with alcohol for most of us, but about living differently, uh, finding confidence, discovering the inspiration to be useful and productive. And once in a while, I'm pleasantly surprised because I realize how much I've changed from the miserable drunk with a splitting head to an optimist exploring today. It's our purpose, with stories, to encourage those obsessed with drinking, to show it's possible to overcome the urge to drink. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Um, First off, we're going to start not with the poem itself, but with more about you and poetry in general. Define some of the terms in your introduction. What is a sonnet? And what is a tonka for those who don't know that? Which well, you know, there there are okay. Italian styles of sonnets, and the the Shakespearean style. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with Shakespeare, so I follow that style. Is is a general rule? I'm correct. I think in saying that every sonnet is fourteen lines. Fourteen right? lines, ten syllable lines, mm-hmm. um, with a rhyme scheme, which mm-hmm. I dispense with because mm-hmm. I think it's sort of a a Houdini trick. Mm-hmm. That sonneteers impose upon themselves, and if you if you try to follow a rhyme scheme, you have to skew your grammar and your meaning to fit this scheme. And I prefer uh, an uncluttered, uh, unconstricted poem. Now I'm I'm going by memory, but how many sonnets are there? There is the Spenserian, and some of them have two names. So there is the Spenserian, mm-hmm. there is the English, and the English is the same as the Shakespearean, right? Right. Spenserian is that I think stands it's, on its own because there's also the Italian sonnet. Yeah, there's the Italian Petrarchan style. Right, the Petrarch. Um, and the, the the rhyme scheme is different. So, right, and and usually that's what differentiates them is yes. the rhyme scheme, right? Right. What is it about the Shakespearean sonnet that really appeals to you? Well, it seems to break down in the quatrains, the four, the units okay. of four. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what you take for your poetry. Yeah, I often follow. It's, it's, sometimes I break down the quatrains, the meaning in the quatrain and, and shift mm -hmm. accordingly. Okay. And, but sometimes I don't. And you've said that what part of what you like about the sonnet is that it tells a story. It tells. It can tell a it story. Can, right. Yes. Okay. And I take it yours usually would tell a story. There are often narrative okay. ones. Okay. But sometimes I'll just play with an image because I like the image. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of your poems coming mm -hmm. up. And I commented on that, uh, which you know, because you read my notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's like you got the trailer for this interview. How did you get your start in poetry? Um, well, I guess the urge to write poems came when I was in Amsterdam, at a train station and taking a ferry over the channel, and uh, I read Shakespeare's sonnets there. So how I, old were you at that point? I was um, 19, okay. 18. I was going to school in Oxford, England. Okay. Took a break. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just I just loved the way Shakespearean sonnets were a puzzle that you had to figure out. And did had you ever read much poetry before that? Um, no, I hadn't, but that opened my eyes. So Shakespeare was the first poet you read. And right. And do you think that's part of why he appealed to you so much, or do you think if you'd read many other poets, he still would have really drawn you the way he did? Um, I don't know. It just was the way it just happened. the way it was. Um, your father was a prolific writer, and he held advanced degrees in philosophy, right? Right. Tell us more about him. You were telling us a well, little before we started. He was a congregationalist minister mm -hmm. who was very serious, and when he was young, they, he, uh, he, he uh, 12 or something like that, he actually gave a sermon in this country church in Melbourne, Australia, and they called him the Little Minister. Mm -hmm. And he took his Christianity very seriously, although he didn't believe in the theology of it all, and that's complicated. That is very complicated. It's very complicated. <laughs> it seems contradictory, but... Yes. And uh, he came to America to get an education, and mm -hmm. he was... He cast a very large intellectual shadow mm -hmm. over me, which I had to outgrow. And he was, he believed in the God of reason. Mm -hmm. And and I really never could accept that for myself. So did you think that there was more to God, less to God, different to God than... Reason? I came across Siddhartha, mm -hmm. Herman Hesse's novel mm -hmm. about Siddhartha in, in high school. In my high school library, that's where I read it. Okay. And I was taken with the uh, uh, the power of meditation that was presented. Mm -hmm. Now, um, he had you read quite a number of books before you went to work for him. And I just, um, that's probably too much to get into it. But I want that list of books someday because I think it's a powerful list of Books by some of the great thinkers of the world. What were some of the books? Well, one was well, Will curious. Durant, Will and Ariel Durant's <laughs> History of Civilization, <laughs> which he, uh, Will Durant uh, and Ariel, his wife, uh, <laughs> were survey historians. So they, they, they laid out the entire history from Samaria on uh, Egypt and went to the East, and it, it ended up about uh, just after the Napoleonic era. And then, in addition to that, my dad had 40 volumes of American Statesmen. Uh, it covered Ben Franklin, Thomas Paine, Samuel Adams, John Randolph of Roanoke, uh, 40 of them. Abraham Lincoln was among them. Is and each so I, book devoted to a different... Yes. Okay. Teddy Roosevelt wrote one of them. Henry Adams one, wrote another. And there are a wonderful introduction to American history, which is separate from the modern way of looking at history. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an early um, uh, 20th century, 19th century uh, look at America, what Americans thought of themselves then. Mm -hmm. So, a fascinating topic. I uh, Years ago, I read transcripts, I believe it was, or at least a book on the debates between Douglas and Lincoln, and it was quite surprising. It's, it was amazing that they could transcribe a whole hours, out more than an hour-long mm -hmm. speech and, mm -hmm. and do it exactly. 
And it was as it was happening see, without right, recording right. devices of any kind. It was interesting to see too that well, how little we really know of history. When I went in and read their words directly, and um, that's a whole different story. Um, we so, are given a version of history. Yeah, we we're, <laughs> we definitely are. <clears throat> Um, which I think should encourage people to do a whole lot more yeah. reading on their own and look into some of these sources. But tell us a little bit about your personal craft of poetry. In the world of novels, we have what novelists, you know, writers refer to ourselves as plotters and pantsers, which means some people write out the whole plot and then follow their outline some people fly by the seat of their pants or write by the seat of their pants. And I think in the, the poetic counterpart would be the daily discipline and planning versus waiting for the muse to strike. And I, I think when we talked to Catherine, she said she's more of waiting for the muse, a little bit more on that side. Is that fair to say? That, but she also said she used prompts. To, right, she uses prompts. To sort of stimulate pants. the muse, if you will. Yeah. So which, which are you? Well, I write every day, and I have a routine that builds up to it. Mm -hmm. But I think I've acquired uh, the capacity of maybe a photographer who's always looking around me for some inspiration. And that can strike at any time. It can strike in the middle of the night, yeah, on my way to a meeting or, or to my office. I'll catch an inspiration. That's the thing. I have to. I want to catch the inspiration like a bird in flight. You just catch something. Mm -hmm. I can make something out of that. That's what I say to myself. So, so I have the discipline of coming in and writing every day, mm -hmm. but I have to have something to come in with. Mm -hmm. and so, so, uh, so what? What kinds of things give you inspiration? Well, I was. Uh, it was. Remember that last February when it was. It was very very cold. Yes. And then the next day. <clears throat> It rained, and I was pulling out of my driveway, and there's an apple tree by my, my driveway, and I, I looked over, and I saw hundreds of drops hanging from the little crooks of the apple mm -hmm. tree, and it was beautiful, mm -hmm. and I, I can make something out of that, that vision of the light glistening in all those drops. It is a lovely vision. And I want to read the poem now. <laughs> so... It, when when something like that happens, you know, presumably you were on your way to work. Do yes. you just stop and write the poem? And if you're late to work, that's okay. But you're you're sort of your own boss, aren't you? I am my own boss. So, I set my own schedule. So you can't fire yourself if you're late <laughs> too often. That's right. <laughs> I set my schedule. Okay. But sometimes I just have to write a note because mm -hmm. I, I've got other things i got to do. Okay. I'm also driven. i got one thing after to do after another. Right. Okay, so you would take the note, go on to do what you do, and then mm -hmm. maybe write the poem the next day. And I get the impression you have sort of an allotted time that you do poetry. Right. Okay. I get up early in the morning, 4.40. Mm -hmm. I do my chores, take care of the cats. And uh, then I sit for 40 minutes of meditation. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part of it. I think it opens me up and makes me flexible. It gives me energy, which is undefinable. I can't say exactly how this has affected me over the three decades now that I've done it. But it, I live differently because mm -hmm. I do it. And then I go to an AA me uh, a meeting, and then I write. And by 9.30, I have to put all that aside and do and my work. go to work. I admire the discipline to get up that early every day. I struggle with that. Um, a lot of your poetry... I understand does speak of alcoholism and recovery, but only really only about ten percent. Oh, really? Uh, okay, ten percent. But mm -hmm. the direction of my poems is inspired by this because to be sober, I have to learn how to do spiritual jujitsu. I have to learn how to take uh, negative energy and transform it into positive energy. I have to look for inspiration to keep myself going. Okay. So you would say you are inspired by sobriety, but your poetry is not about sobriety. It is. There are about 10% of it. 10%. But I don't want to just dwell on that alone right. because there's so much more to there's life so than more. just that. Right. And I think that's the best way of looking at it, you know, not to focus on one thing like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it also seems to me that you, the poems that I've read of yours are about 
there's a theme of like growth and change. Yes, uh, that's the magical thing about it. Now each um, each one of us has the capacity to become uh, a happier, freer person. We don't know the road to get there. We we think it's something external to us, but it it's internal, and we have to find the road. And that's that's why I look forward to reading a lot more of your poetry. I think that there's a lot of hope in it, and I think that's something that we could use more of in poetry these days. I think that we are ready to go on to beer number two. Uh. So, Michael, what is beer number two? Uh, beer number two is an old favorite uh, Pilsner Urquell. It is the original Pilsner. Um, and this is also non-alcoholic, isn't it? This is not. Oh, it's not? This is not non-alcoholic. Okay. Um, so, the reason I chose... This this poem was a challenge to, to pair to. Oh. And I ended up... Uh, this is the what, mm. the wood flooring of the Zen Oh, temple. yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and I really liked this one. And I kind of... There's the image of the, the worn... I imagined it as black lacquered, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, wood flooring of this temple, worn through age and use. Um, Pilsner Urkel, in a way, is that. It's a, it's the original Pilsner, like I said. It's been around. It has uh, survived uh, copies and, uh, like, dumbing down. It's It's... It's been well used. Uh, but the other reason I went for this is because the poem has a, a definite theme of contemplation. And I have been known to wax very poetic about Pilsners um, because it is my favorite beer style. And one of the things that I love about them is they're simple enough that they don't demand your attention. You can just kind of take them in and, and let them go. Or... You can contemplate them, and if you do, there's a great reward that comes from that because there's a lot of depth and complexity there that isn't apparent on the surface. So that is kind of the the real thrust of what I was getting at with this pairing. Well, you're very poetic with your analysis of taste. <laughs> I am a beer writer and <laughs> have been known to... to uh, write things that are very poetic like that about beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as, as Michael and I enjoy our Pilsner, go ahead and read uh, what, is, what is the title of the poem. There isn't a title. That's what I thought. I now, just Shakespeare's, put it in there too. You know, uh, some people use titles, but yeah. uh, sh uh, when people refer to Shakespeare's sonnets, they often use the first line as a that's, title. That's, that's what, what I, I did. I stuck it in there because yep. I had to call it something uh -huh. right. to uh, tell what you were going to read. Go okay. ahead. So, the wood flooring of the Zen temple was old and the boards were worn by the feet of generations and they creaked underfoot as we walked mindfully as the flooring was unsteady and sitting in the hall listening to people walking engaged me as we practiced quiet watchfulness because the stepping was impressive and as I'm practicing quiet watchfulness today I realize how much of my mind resembles the flooring of the temple worn with experience into patterns. As I'm sitting in the hall of my mind listening, I enjoy the morning sun. Thought is only thought, often repetitive. I want to sit in the sacred place absorbing magical emanations. Very beautiful. So that image of the floor in this just really sticks with you. <laughs> well, it's it was uh, the temple's name is Hoshinji in the city of Obama in the Sea of Japan, a hundred miles across the island from Kyoto where I lived. And I used to, I started out by going there. I say I would arrange my schedule. I would teach for like crazy morning and evening, uh, morning, evening, afternoon for three weeks, and then I could take a week off at Berlitz, where I worked. Mm -hmm. So I drove across the island, and I could sit, I could go there for seven days of meditation. We, and they would have these, these sashins, what they call them, and they would last for, you know, from 
4 o'clock in the morning, and they go till 9 o'clock at night meditating. Mm -hmm. All these endless periods. And um, I started out driving a big motorcycle. Then as I went into it, I, I went to a 50cc scooter and drove mm -hmm. more slowly. And that's the way Zen practice is, actually. You go slower and you absorb more of your surroundings. But it, it's... it's uh, Every motion in the week almost is scripted in silence where you do a certain thing at a certain this time. This is at the temple. At the temple. Okay. And everyone's serious and they're just, there's mm -hmm. very little talking. Mm -hmm. And there was a place to sit and, and, and watch and rest in between periods. And I would just, it, it's, um, it's uh, starting a session is like ascending a mountain, a very high mountain. You're walking up it, you're not scaling mm -hmm. with ropes and things but about <clears throat> three quarters of the way through the, the weariness wears off and you just you're just picked up and carried along and um so i i have you you are answering all my questions before i ask them <laughs> <laughs> you're not making this easy young man. <laughs> But I, I was going to ask them things like that, and I have this beautiful, you know, thing to say about the imagery in the poem. Um, but what you're saying raises some questions. Mm -hmm. What what brought you to Japan in the first place? What brought you there? How old were you? Well, I, I think I was around uh, 22, 23. I just sobered up. I was going back and you forth. You did it again. I was going to ask, did you go before or after sobriety? Yeah, before. <laughs> okay, so you went, no, I thought you said you had just... Just sobered gone. up. Okay, so and right then, after. Well, two, actually two years. I, I rode the University Avenue, the bus was down there. I had several jobs as a being a waiter. And I found the Jewish Vocational Center. I went there to, to learn some skills or reorient. And I read this book, Jobs Japan. It was all about teaching English. And um, I, in high school, I learned about meditation, Siddhartha. Mm -hmm. okay. But I, this was the first time I could actually practice it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, a friend introduced me to this temple. Mm -hmm. So you picked up the book about teaching English in mm -hmm. Japan, and you were how old then? Uh, 24. 24, okay. So that was a couple years after whatever we talked about last, when you were 22. Yes. Um, so you I, picked up a I book hit bottom, I sobered up. It, did you have a college degree at that oh, point? Oh, yes. Okay, yes. what's your degree in? English Lit and Journalism. Okay. Spent a year in Oxford, England, in St. Mm -hmm. Michael's Hall. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's right. And so you go to Japan to teach English. What did you expect of going there? Was it that partly It was an adventure. Were... I almost okay. joined the Navy. I wanted to be mm -hmm. a writer on the aircraft carrier mm -hmm. but they couldn't guarantee that mm -hmm. then they made the mistake this is 1983 84 around then i told them i was in recovery and they didn't want mm -hmm. me they i guess they weren't hard up yeah. for sailors at they that time want you. <laughs> so i decided to go to japan instead okay. And but you were hoping to get more involved in Buddhism there, or was that just sort of a side? No, effect? it's just something that happened. Okay. I, the seed was planted, okay. and as soon as I I saw the opportunity, I wanted mm -hmm. to find out what real meditation was like. Mm -hmm. Okay, how long were you in Japan altogether? Nine years. Nine years. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I was thinking a couple of years. Oh no. So, I came back with a wife and two kids. <laughs> you know, every time I move. I double the number of kids. I <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he did kind of the same thing. So I'm curious, with uh, other writers we've asked about the importance of uh, like place of origin in their writing. I'm curious, you've traveled so much and lived in so many different places. Uh, how does that impact your writing? Well, it, uh, it helps me to appreciate the home that I have. To appreciate um, the cottonwood that was that's on my property, um, a sense of belonging. Um, to notice, to be uh, really kind of cosmopolitan and open to all kinds of people. Uh, the Japanese are unusual people, but I, but I felt living there over time. It's sort of like being a potted plant. There's only you can't put your roots out very far because mm -hmm. it's a different culture and it's you know so uh, my travel has made me appreciate home. 
That's an interesting point. I mean, I, I've spent my life traveling, too, because I grew up in the military, and um, I don't know, Minnesota's very cold, and yes. <laughs> I'm not appreciating it. <laughs> I'm kind of missing the Pacific Northwest. Um, can you tell your listeners, how do you define Zen and Dharma, and what do these words mean to you? Zen is a subset of Buddhism that okay, grew it's... from China. It's what's called, there are two, there are the Tara Vaden, mm -hmm. uh, and which is Southeast Asian, and, and Mahayana, which is uh, called the large, large vehicle, which uh, came to China, Tibet, and over to Japan. It's maybe more technical than you need. But Zen is a, a, a radical simplification of the, the elaborate uh, okay. trappings of Buddhism in general. And um, I like to think of myself just sitting quietly, letting my thoughts come and letting them go. That's my mm -hmm. practice, as if my mind were a bowl. It fills up and empties with thoughts. And I don't try to grasp my thoughts or wrench them away. So I adopt the posture of Zen, which I'm going to do right now. Don't which you... fall off the bench. No, I won't. I won't. I Can, you try to... Can you describe this posture? Well, my legs are... It doesn't... Not every... I sit lotus. I sit the lotus mm -hmm. position. Not everyone sits in this position. There are other positions. But the posture <laughs> allows me to uh, to... To watch my the operation of my mind and just let it be, so that all that is happening are my thoughts and feelings, and if I'm going through difficulty, I don't run away from it. I just let the thoughts percolate, come and go, and that's the practice. And when mm -hmm. I'm not sitting in the posture, my thoughts come and go as they normally do. I was teaching a meditation to a group of kids once, and and after a small bit of time I, I i we we talked about what happened she's nothing happened <laughs> she she doesn't wasn't noticing her, her normal thoughts she wasn't listening to the birds and thinking that was anything special she wasn't think, seeing what thoughts her thoughts were but uh, zen is all about noticing just How noticing she? oh she was a uh, teenager 13 okay. or so okay so a little young still to start thinking about the beauty of the birds. She was probably thinking who texted her today. And uh -huh. <laughs> right. And not thinking um, that's anything special. Right, but right, we, we can that. never escape mm -hmm. the trajectory of our minds. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the comment that I had about this poem and this imagery of the wooden floor and these people going over it and over it and over it. That, to me, it really brought out this idea that what we go over and over and over in our minds really changes who we are, for better or worse. Um, now, Tekken is your Dharma name. What does it mean to have a Dharma name? And is it something you chose or that was given to no, you? No, it was given to me. It's okay. a Dharma name. You, uh, you're given a, a name when you take Buddhist vows. Okay. Are you given the name by another person? Yes. Okay. I, went, uh, I, went, I go to a Zen temple in St. Paul called okay. Clouds and Waters. Judith Regeer, White Lotus, that was the, uh, the head Roshi, the teacher. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they set up a year-long process where you study the precepts, which mm -hmm. are, there are 16 of them. And then you, you sew a little garment that you wear. Mm -hmm. and what, what would some of the precepts be? Um, not to, to, to cease doing evil, to do good, to do good, to do good for others. Um, the Buddha Sangha uh, Dharma, those mm -hmm. are the three treasures, mm -hmm. honor each one of those. Um, one is not to take intoxicating uh, and beverages, mm -hmm. another is not to indulge anger, not mm -hmm. to raise myself and lower another person. Mm -hmm. So really in a lot of ways, the same things that all the great faiths of the world teach. Yes. Like yes. Be nice to other people. Right. And be moderate. And uh -huh. So, who gave you the name? Tekken, that was yeah. uh, Judith Regeer. Okay. White okay. Lotus gave it to me. It means Iron Man, settled practitioner of great determination. Okay. It's from 12th century uh, Japanese. Mm -hmm. the, the one of right in the Shobo Genzo. Dogen wrote about Iron Man. Okay. Now, say that name again. 
uh, uh, Dogen, Dogen okay. Zenji. He was okay. the founder of Zen in mm -hmm. Japan. He I'm trying to remember if I <clears throat> read any of his work when I was in college. <laughs> I, the name sounds vaguely familiar. Mm -hmm. I, I think I may have. That's that's a long time ago. So I think that we are ready for beer number three. Well, and... I keep talking because I have to get it out <laughs> of the refrigerator. I, I did have one more question in the freezer and hope it didn't explode in there. Uh, did you consciously study the literature and poetry of Japan and England when you were in each of those places? Oh, yes. I, I took tutorials on English poets. So mm -hmm. I went through a oh, lot apart of Apart from ones. Shakespeare, who else? Oh, Lord Byron. Uh, I thought you were saying, oh, Lord, comma. <laughs> no, Lord no, Byron. Lord Byron. <laughs> Keats, uh, Wordsworth, Shelley, um, Carlyle. <clears throat> okay, so quite, uh, apart from Shakespeare, who would be your favorite of the English poets? John Keats. Okay, why? Well, he he's sort of a tragic figure and he mm -hmm. appealed to me. Lord Byron, too. Um, I'm, I'm rather drawn to Lord Byron for several reasons. Uh, what about Japanese poets? Um, Matsuo Basho. Yes, Isa I and know him. Ryokan, yeah. yeah. Not personally, but... Yeah, Matsuo yeah. Basho. Um, he's, he's, a... he's one you stumble across quite a bit if you look at Japanese poets at all, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Usan's another one. <laughs> okay, and are any of them modern? I think... They're old. They're older. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready for beer number three. All right. Uh, so beer number three, we're back to a non-alcoholic beer. This is a different brewery. This is a brewery called Wellbeing, brewing out of mm. St. Louis. Uh, and this is, they call it Heavenly Body Golden Wheat. Um, this poem is about, like, overcoming those... Mm nagging negative thoughts that, that flow into your head in the middle of the night and keep you awake. Uh, and and uh, the light on the other side of that, if you will. And so I was looking for that other side. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something that was light and, and this, golden and this refreshing. Is light. Um, so this is, as I said, a golden wheat beer. Um, and it is all of those things. And there's some orangey notes in the background. It's just like sunshine in a glass, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lovely color. Go ahead and read. Well, that just what you said, though. It is like sunlight. I love mm -hmm. sunlight. Okay. Like a basset hound with droopy skin and ears, baying so mournfully at the moon and disturbing my sleep, I've tossed about with worry. And during the day, the hound gets his teeth into a rag and won't let go, no matter how I pull to free myself from cogitating over offensive words. And it's useless to ruminate with sad eyes, with my hound's head between outstretched paws on the floor, because wherever my thoughts go, my paws are sure to follow. So I've learned to throw the dog a bone, to let myself chew joyfully on projects that channel enthusiastic energy. When I'm searching for the appropriate words and images to fit an emerging line of thought, I don't know my tail's wagging. Hmm. I really identified with that, the, the basset hound and gnawing in the night because I, that's, that's when I wake up and like just ponder things that I should have be shouldn't be pondering. <laughs> right, right. Ruminating. Ruminating is useless. How you should have responded uh, yes. to someone and yeah, I love the image of the basset hound in this poem. It reminds me of a little stuffed dog I was given years ago, um, which of course got named Count Basie. You know, Basset Count <laughs> Basie. And that's um, you know, there's that saying about you should be nice to me because I'm a writer. <laughs> I've never heard that saying. Um, <laughs> you, well, it's something to the effect of, watch out, I might write you into a book. Or, uh, you yeah. know, gotcha. If you had wanted to be portrayed differently in my book, you should have acted differently. Um, so, yeah, the person who gave me that dog was one of the very interesting 
stories in my life. Um, and I, I wouldn't write it to be mean. It's just an interesting story. So anyway, but, you know, as I, as I first read this poem, I thought about the contradictions that Basset Hounds always look so sad. And, and that dog was, it was given to me at a time that was, I was in a little bit of upheaval. And yet, I look at that dog, or I think about it, I think it's long since disappeared, and I, I still smile about it because of the note that was attached to it, and um, as I said, the very interesting person who gave it to me. So this piece is the perfect piece for one of the questions that I wanted to ask, which was, do you start with an idea and look for an image to illustrate it, or do you start with uh, Say that the other way around for me. An image and look for the... <laughs> do you start with the image and look for the idea or develop an idea from it, or do you start with the idea and look for an image to go with it? This poem was written so long ago, I forget which way it was. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it can go work, It can go either way. Okay. So sometimes yeah. one... Do you tend to do one more than the other, do you think? Uh, I'm visual. Okay, so you would I'm tend really to visual. start. I think that's the way I do too, but as I read this, it really, I was struck by the way you created a whole um, I th- idea and philosophy. I think I wanted to talk about, you know, just thoughts that wouldn't shut off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think you did a great job with it because I was thinking, what if I wanted to write a poem about thoughts that won't stop or right. ruminating? Mm-hmm. And I kind of like that this actually fits with that. Uh, wooden floor of the temple and going over it and sure. over it and we go over and over these Yeah, thoughts. I mean, s- self-pity is is not attractive. Right. But, I, I was no, but it's a fact yeah. of life that mm-hmm. we have that and, and how we do you escape struggle that? It. We all struggle with it, yeah. But I was thinking, how would I look for an image to illustrate that if I started with that idea? Well, that's, you know, uh, this poem is also about play. play. Poetry, for me, you have a, some questions down there, does poetry matter? Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if it matters. It, it, it's, it's, a, I, it's one of the subgroups of poets that I belong to. Mm-hmm. It's play for me. Uh-huh. And I love the concision of poetry, where you have to boil it down to its essence. Right. It's kind of a mind puzzle. Right. And, and you can use images to get your point across. Um, it's just a big game. And I like the sonnet because it's short enough, and you can come at things from so many different angles. Um but to tie it up on a, a little package and mm-hmm. present it to the world right. and maybe make somebody else laugh or share it in or, a way that makes me smile. Right. So I write, I write in the morning, and if I'm successful, if I can write a poem, it, it picks me up and I, it carries me throughout the day through all the frustrations. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about your entire series because you have a whole series of poetry that will do just what you're talking about. Tell us the title of your series. Well, Everyday Mind. And how many books are in it now? Well, so far, so far uh, yeah. I've, I've uh, actually, I'm on every, I just finished Everyday Mind 11. Okay. And you number them with Roman numerals, yep. right? Yeah, okay. and, there's, and there's 100 pages of poetry to each one. Okay, and it's always exactly 100? Yes. Okay, so you write 100 pages and then the next book comes mm-hmm. out. And how often are they coming out then? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm about doing three uh, a year now. Three wow. a year. Okay, uh, so so in, in the last two years, I've, uh, by the end of this year, in two years, I'll, I'll publish 12. I have 12 of them. And so you started these just two years ago? No, actually I started four four years ago. It took me a while to to work up a method that was productive. Is there a significance to a hundred pages? It's just the game I play. I used to try I used to try to justify, well why do you do a sonnet and a tonka? It's the game I play. You know, so there's no there's I mean, why a ten syllable line? I don't know. It's not something you can measure. Mm -hmm. It's a practice, it's a discipline doesn't have to be. Mm-hmm. It's just what I'm doing right now. And your, your poems tend to be relatively short, right? Yes. So 100 pages would be approximately 100 poems each. Yes. Okay. Tell us about the significance of the title Everyday Mind. Everyday Mind is a Japanese phrase. You know, one monk says to another, where is the way? Mm-hmm. The way is everyday mind. It's your ordinary, the ordinary operation of 
my mind. Mm -hmm. And so your poems, is it fair to say then, would be illustrating the everyday operation of your mind? Right. Well, I'm making anthologies. Every mm -hmm. time I get to fight 500, I'm going to mm -hmm. group them all together. Mm -hmm. and, and you and have one anthology so one far? One anthology. By the end of the year, I'll have another. Right. And because those are called an exploration of consciousness, because mm -hmm. that's what it is. Okay. Do you do any annotating of those, discussing what... You know what you were thinking when you wrote the poem, or um, the evolution no. of your craft. I'll, I'll start. Like I'll, I will start out with an essay explaining, okay. so, give an overview. Right. So these would be five hundred page books or more. Right. That's a pretty thick spine. Yeah, <laughs> and nobody's going to read that, you know. So I. But it's nice to have, yeah. and um, if somebody wants to read a whole body of work, mm -hmm. to be able to get, you know, single books. It's an organizing principle. Um, does each book have its own theme, or are they strictly chronological, or is there any other order to them? Um, I fell in love with the, the Japanese habit of watching the se seasonal changes, okay. so that's a big theme. So I'll just ha it'll happen to go through one and a little bit more of a season. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, memory it takes... Uh, has a place is in my book, so it, it's not stuck in any mm -hmm. time period. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, and I, I sometimes group poems together. Like I'll have a section on uh, my poems on asphalt driveway poems. Yes, I, I read that in the uh, <laughs> what, what poems are included. <clears throat> what inspired you to write about an asphalt driveway? Well, not one driveway. I okay, worked on asphalt driveways. driveway crews okay. for three summers mm -hmm. working my way through college, back mm -hmm. when you could pay for your own college. Mm -hmm. That's how far... Those were the days. <laughs> yeah, those were the days. So, and I, I, I worked with um, young laborers, and I was mm -hmm. a young laborer, and, and I, I fell into another subgroup of, of people mm -hmm. who, who work hard. Yes, Work so, very hard. So I imagine then the poems end up not being necessarily strictly about asphalt driveways, but about the people. Oh, about the per and the people and the work and the idea of maybe working hard or working your way right. to college. So it's really again using an image uh -huh. to explore something way beyond that image. Um, the covers of your book, are, of books plural, are beautiful. Where do you get them from? My daughter turned really? out to be a real artist. She draws them or paints them? She, well, she, she paints and draws. Okay. She's just right. going back for her master's now. If Are I, they watercolors? Um, uh, yes, oils. Oils. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're, that's one of the things that really jumped out at me. So every single one of them is her artwork. Yes. Okay. And we are a father-daughter team. And, and then what, you have two children. Your other is? Uh, he's uh, got an, an electrical engineering degree okay. at UMD, computer engineering. So now he's up in Alaska working in an, all night in a deli. Don't ask me why. Oh. And he wants to go to, back to culinary school. <clears throat> and, and either in Hawaii or New York, he hasn't decided yet. Uh-huh. Change of passions. Yes. Yeah, well, well, he happens. doesn't want to do code. Yeah. Code is in programming. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are getting really close to the wrap-up. Any last words about your Zen practice or sobriety? I mean, it seems like they really go together well. I would just like to meet people in the poetry world and, and find out what it's like to uh, meet other writers. Mm -hmm. oh, well, how long have you been involved? Because I met you, what, three years ago maybe? Four? No. Is no, it, it was just uh, last year I started going to the readings. Oh, it hasn't it been that, that long. I've been, I've been, I have a writing group in Stillwater. Okay. And um, but I know you from Barbaric Yop, right? Yep, that's where yeah. I started the okay. first group. Okay, yeah, out. that's the first step I took into the world of poetry too. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I was studying and writing before that, but yes. that was the first time I ever actually got up on stage and read mm -hmm. any of my own work. So, yeah. Well, any final thoughts? Uh, where can people find you, like in in the the internet world? Internet world, <clears throat> I guess Facebook. My Facebook page, you can you can find my page uh, under Barry MacDonald M A C, or um, maybe Tekken, but you can find me there, and I'll I'll have my books posted. 
links okay. to them. Okay. Yeah. Do you, you keep the links up on your Facebook page for the public to see? Yes. Okay. Is it a link directly to Amazon? Uh, yes, it okay. is. Right, okay. right to the page. Okay, great. So, and those links will also be on our website. Mm-hmm. Michael, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at aperfectpint.net and on the other socials as aperfectpint. And we also have, you have to tell them every time. Okay, we have. I, I can never keep track. Books, booksandbrews.net or website. on Instagram, book mm, brews. <laughs> Uh, so, book, One. singular, the letter N, bruise. <laughs> yes, and you can Where can find, they find you? Well, I'm unfortunately very easy to find, or fortunately, <laughs> depending on the day, um, because there aren't that many Laura Vosikas in the world. Um, excuse me, I am at, uh, several links will take you to the same site, lauravosika.com. Uh, I can't believe I can't remember my URL, bluebellschronicles.com. It used to, I think it used to be Bluebells Trilogy, and I think that will also take you there. I am on Instagram and Twitter, and I think I'm pretty much Laura Vosica everywhere, or Laura underscore Vosica at Facebook. It's facebook.com slash Laura dot Vosica dot author. And let's see, Barry, we have your links. What upcoming events? Do you have any coming up? Well, I'll be reading at Bird's Nest Poetry and Egg Roll Cafe. Okay. But um, that'll be in uh, just a few days. Oh, okay. So that's... That will that'll, we'll have happened by the time this goes up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, although Bird's Nest Poetry does happen every month. Mm-hmm. And what, is it the third Sunday of every month? It's the final Sunday of final every month. Final Sunday of every month. Okay. So, but you said you're not the featured reader. This. Not this time, but... Okay, I'll but you're one. doing the open mic mm-hmm. afterward. Okay. I think I got there too late to sign up for open mic last time. Um, Michael, do you have any events coming up? I do not. Oh, okay. Well, you do. Simple you, enough. <laughs> you have all those. None that anybody can. Events, none that anybody right, can go see. Unless they want to follow you around the country. Um, I have coming up, and actually, Barry, aren't you involved in this? The the anthology that Gabriel's Horn. Yes, just I'm put doing out. that. Yeah, the anthology is called Startled by Joy, Mm -hmm. and it is a collection of new poetry in classical form. So, Barry, do you have two poems in that? I think you have two. Yes, I have two. And there was another one of yours that I really liked and wanted to include that you submitted, but I couldn't think how to make it fit the theme of joy. Mm -hmm. So there is an anthology coming up for American history or, you know, Legend and Lore of America, something like that. Because the poem's about John Henry, right? Yes. I think so, yeah. Um, anyway, the Startled by Joy poets, and they're, they'll be doing the reading, and then there will be an open mic, and we have the uh, the one at Egg Roll Queen Cafe. Mm-hmm. That will Which, be over yes. by the time this airs. But then we have another one coming up Sunday, October 6th, at the Troubadour Wine Bar. Where I, is that? Well... I was just going to say, I can't believe I know the address off the top of my head, because <laughs> I forgot to write it down. I believe the address is 28, it's 2827 Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis, I believe, and that is Sunday, October 6th, 5.30 to 7.30. Are you going to be up yes, there? Yes, I'll Great. be there. Okay, so we have a few poets at that, and myself and Michael Dean will be there, and there will be an open mic after that also. And then coming up next month, do you want to tell us about Anya? Uh, we have Anya De Niro. Uh, because do you, do you see what I did here? I pasted in the bio she sent me, and I didn't realize that it came out. <laughs> wow, and, that, and it's like, like this two, tiny two little two line. It looks like, like an underline. Point one font. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I was looking at that going, I know I pasted it in, but I forgot that every time I paste in lately, it's coming up in this little font. So tell so, us about Anya. Uh, Anya writes... Uh, uh, young adult literature. Okay, so she will be coming up next month, and I think she's just got a book just released. Just released, right, or so just about to be released. About, I think by the time her interview goes up, it will yes. be out. So, thank you very much, Barry. And that's it for episode five and of uh, Books and Brews podcast. So thank a you shout again. Out to, we forgot to update how many subscribers and listeners we now have. A hundred million. 
I thought it was 100 million last time. I think it's up to like 175 million huh. this time. So, um, you know, you guys will have to jostle for space to leave comments mm -hmm. on our YouTube channel, but good luck. Get in there fast, leave your comments. Cheers. Mm -hmm.